This is CBC Here and Now. Tonight, an early morning fire rips through a home in Natwashish. It could have been fatal if not for the quick thinking of a relative nearby. It's official. The Newfoundland Growlers are the baby, baby Maple Leafs. Coming up, we'll find out how officials feel about putting local players on the team. Things don't always go as planned, and I didn't expect this to happen. I didn't get drafted. <laughs> it was a tough night. All my family flew up. Um, my girlfriend at the time, was my wife now, was there, all my brothers. And every pick, all these camera lights come on. And I'm just there like, okay, anybody, just take me. And in the last half hour of tonight's program, we bring you Home Court, the Carl English story. It's a 30-minute documentary detailing the life of a local boy and his rise to basketball fame. Good evening, I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Jeremy Eaton. Welcome to Here and Now. Let's get straight into our top story. Three people in Natwashish are breathing a sigh of relief tonight after making it out of an early morning house fire unharmed. They're also thankful to those who woke them up and got them out of the house before it was too late. Here Now's Jacob Barker has that story. It's not a nice way to wake up. Sage Nui and two others woke up to the sound of people breaking windows, trying to alert them that there was a fire breaking out. I was looking around for my coat because I only had my tank top on. And then after that, I was looking for my boots, but uh, I couldn't find them. And then I ran out of the room. When I got to the hallway, there was smoke on the ceiling. And then when I got to the back door to the kitchen, that's where the fire started, right by the door. This video shot at about 5 a.m. shows the aftermath of their narrow escape. RCMP say the fire started near the back porch, spread to the roof. The Natwashish Fire Brigade did make attempts to extinguish the fire, but it spread quickly and engulfed the entire house. The trio escaped from the back door, which minutes later was fully ablaze. The door frame was on fire. I did manage to get out of the house by leaning somewhere, leaning back against, uh, away from the fire. We, we got out just in time. The video also shows one man going back into the house, said to be trying to retrieve some items from inside. Nui is relieved, especially because she's able to see her two daughters again. really thankful right now. But she, along with others in the house, don't believe it was any accident. I'm scared right now because somebody, somebody started that fire. It didn't start out by itself. Why would a fire just start all of a sudden by itself? The police are now investigating, but they have not said whether or not they believe foul play is a factor. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Labrador. It was a narrow miss for the driver of a dump truck in Portugal Cove, St. Phillips, late this afternoon. The driver told CBC he heard an explosion followed by a second blast. And after that, he says the truck was engulfed in flames within seconds. It happened on Oliver's Pond Road just before 4 o'clock. Members of the Portugal Cove, St. Phillips Fire Department were called to extinguish the fire. The driver escaped unharmed. A specialist at Gander's Hospital says she has been bullied and intimidated and can't go back to work. Paula Kennedy has been on leave from Central Health since October. She is speaking out in a last-ditch effort to save her career. Here now is Garrett Barry reports. The stakes were high when Paula Kennedy stepped into our CBC studio. She says she's likely to be fired for the story we're telling you tonight. I'm fully expecting to be fired. My options are to stay home and lose my career because I've just been out of work for so long, or to come in here and take a chance that perhaps someone might step up and do the right thing, like Premier Ball did for the female MHAs, and I'm hopeful that by speaking out that that action will be taken. The problem started here. Kennedy was a radiologist at this site for years, but she says she was unfairly passed up for a promotion in 2015, and she decided to speak out. I had a proven track record in gander radiology and a perfect employee record at that point. And it was just simply incredible to me at that time that he could make that decision. And we challenged him on it and said, you know, why are you doing this? And I think from that point, I became a target. She also did an interview that year with CBC, critical of Central Health. She spoke out to support a colleague. More than a year later, she got this, a critical performance review by her superiors. No problems listed with patient care, but multiple unsatisfactory marks under relationships with managers. And then, a letter from a vice president at Central Health 
detailing what he called her disrespect towards regional chiefs and other co-workers. Kennedy says it was unfair. Dr. Um, Cole took great issue with the CBC interview, so that became part of my evaluation. And there was also a lot of, I guess, false allegations made up against me that I had no way to defend myself from uh, as part of the credentials process. Last summer, her hospital privileges were revoked. Kennedy says that's like being fired. She appealed that decision to the Central Health Board and won, but she hasn't been able to go back to her normal working life. Kennedy says the environment inside Central Health is still unsafe. I can't sit down and read out a list of CTs or a list of x-rays and have one eye on the computer and one eye looking over my back wondering, you know, if, is someone else going to make a false allegation of harassment? Kennedy says now she wants the province's politicians to intervene in her case. She wants an independent investigation of what happened to her at Central Health, and she says managers should be removed from her chain of command until that is completed. Politicians going to intervene in her case. We did ask Health Minister John Hagee if he was going to intervene here. We had an interview with him. He said it would be inappropriate for him as Health Minister to get involved in what he called a human resources matter. He said the role of government isn't to take sides and isn't to be partisan, but rather to set policy and direction for organizations. He said his message for anyone who felt that the system wasn't working is that there are avenues outside the system, like the offices of the citizen's representative or a court of law. Health said about the situation. Well, we also asked for interviews with Central Health, and we didn't get that. We asked for the players involved in this story. Instead, we got a statement, and here is what the statement has said. Central Health said it will not comment on individual cases, but says it does not accept disrespectful behavior in the workforce and has policies in place to address allegations of bullying. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Garrett Berry in Gander. Metrobus wants to make things easier for its passengers. Okay. It unveiled a host of new features in St. John's today. Five new touch smart screen kiosks are being installed at major stops around the city. Passengers can get free Wi-Fi, they can charge their phones, get real-time bus updates, and call emergency services all from the hub. Now the first one's up and running here on Torbay Road near McDonald Drive, and so far riders like what they see. I think a Wi-Fi hotspot would be great. You don't know when your bus is coming, you don't know when it's going to be late, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be missing. And if you don't have internet, you can't tell. If you use your data, it costs money, you know what I mean? I, I think it's great, actually. Uh, it'll really help if like, people don't have, uh, if their phones aren't active or something, then they can just check the Wi-Fi to see when the buses come then. So it makes it a lot easier. Hopefully everything works out fine. Cornerbrook tradespeople are still protesting at the site of the future hospital and long-term care facility today. For four days, about two dozen plumbers, pipe fitters, and carpenters have been at the entrance to the site. They claim that PEI subcontractors hired steel workers, bypassing local qualified workers. At one point today, the group prevented trucks carrying steel from entering the site. Protesters say they plan to stay until local workers are hired. It's official. The Newfoundland Growlers are the baby, baby leafs. The province's newest ECHL team confirmed its affiliation with the Toronto team earlier today. Here now is Katie Breen has that story. The St. John's Maple Leafs. It was 1991 and they were our first professional sports team. The Leafs played in St. John's for more than a decade and after stints with other teams and other leagues, Toronto's back. Toronto chose here because there's a tremendous history uh, between our organization and this community. Uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs had an affiliation uh, with the St. John's Maple Leafs for 14 years, which was extremely successful. Uh, we know about the passion in this market, we know about the accountability in this market, and we think that this is an absolute slam dunk home run for our organization. The St. John's Maple Leafs played AHL hockey, one league below the NHL. The Growlers will play two leagues below, in the ECHL. But rumor has it, it'll be a big team with a lot of talent. Some of these players will be on AHL contracts because they won't make the Toronto Marlies and they'll come down and play with us. So by theory, uh, your team should be, should be competitive if you have those type of uh, competitive players that, that are under roster. 
At the announcement today, officials said the hunt for a head coach is on. They're interviewing candidates now and should soon know who will be at the helm. The roster will start filling out in the next week to 10 days. And I think one of the things that you've got to be really careful about uh, is not putting a local player on this team for the sake of being a local player. I don't think that's fair to the organization. I don't, I don't think that's fair to the fans. And I think most importantly, I don't think it's fair to the player. Because you better not put a player in a situation where he can't at least uh, have an attempt at being successful. Uh, having said that, are we looking at potential Newfoundland players? Yes, we are. The Newfoundland Growlers and the St. John's Edge play out of the same building and work under the same sports organization. We learned today that there will be ticket deals for both teams, but the details are soon to come. Katie Breen, CBC News, St. John's. The goal, Greening looks to get to it. Lilligren into our goal. Mueller, Greening scores! The Growlers feed into the Leafs AHL farm team, the Toronto Marlies, which features their own Colin Greening, seen here scoring last week against the Texas Stars. The Marlies could win the Calder Cup tonight. In Game 7 of the series, Greening admits he's a little nervous. It's exciting. Um, you know, obviously it, it can even bring a lot of little nerves too as well, but I think when you look at it as from a positive standpoint that it's... You know, obviously, it gives you an opportunity to to kind of like step up in a pivotal moment. Then, you know, you'll see. Uh, I think it brings a little smile on your face. So.
Let's meet our young athlete of the day. This is Maddie Curry, an athletic, energetic eight-year-old from Grand Falls, Windsor. Maddie is a member of the Perfectly Centered Gymnastics Club, so not only does she do gymnastics... But she also loves to play hockey, she swims, and pretty much any other sport she can possibly participate in. So congratulations, Maddie. And we also have another young athlete. This is Kenneth Hillier. He's an active four-year-old who plays uh, T-ball for the Portugal Cove St. Phillips Pirates. He, al he also practices martial arts, loves to fish, and ride his four-wheeler. And who wouldn't love to do that? <laughs> Congratulations, <laughs> Kenneth, on being our young athlete of the day. Carolyn, uh, cool temperatures, but mm -hmm. lots of sunshine, at least where we were late later today as yeah. the day went on. It was great to see it. It was nice to see a bit of sun that is going to change. Uh, right now, actually, there are some showers that will be moving in and uh, yeah, affecting the south coast and uh, the Avalon Peninsula <laughs> overnight tonight. Let's just get right to it. Uh, here's a look at our weather on the way headlines in the good news category. Uh, it's a fabulous Friday coming for uh, central parts of the island and the western portion of the island. So heading into the weekend, it's going to be quite nice. Saturday is looking overall good, uh, but there is a chance of some little pop up showers uh, for central areas. And uh, yeah, dandy uh, Sunday coming for uh, Father's Day. If you have any outdoor activities, it's going to be cool, but it's looking pretty good so far. So this is the system that I was just talking about that's bearing down on the province right now. It's going to bring about 5 to 10 millimeters of rain for the Burren Peninsula, about 2 to 4 uh, millimeters of rain for the Avalon Peninsula. So we're looking at uh, the showers along the south there. Cool temperatures for central and the northern peninsula, about 2 degrees uh, this evening. Chance of a, a messy mix of uh, showers and uh, flurries for Cartwright tonight. Now we do have this frost warning in effect for the northern peninsula, the, for central areas and the north coast there. So yeah, it's going to be cooling down. It's going to be clear skies. So you want to protect your plants for sure. So as we get into Friday, things are going to stay fairly drizzly here in the east, clearing off nicely though for the rest of the island. You can see some shower activity there in Labrador as well. So Friday evening as you're heading home from work, things are still going to be a bit drizzly if you're, uh, if you're here in the east. And temperatures are staying fairly cool. Um, uh, with that system. So seven degrees is the high tomorrow for St. John's. But as you head towards central, things do get much nicer. Grand Falls, Windsor, Humber Valley, all looking at 19 degrees with some sunshine tomorrow. A great way to kick off the weekend for sure. As you head into Labrador, chance of some uh, flurries and showers there along the coast and some cooler temperatures. Labrador City looking at mainly cloudy skies uh, tomorrow with a high of 13 degrees. So Friday night into Saturday. So many people are asking me what's Saturday going to be like? It's looking pretty good. So here we are Saturday afternoon. There are some uh, showers here along the coast and a chance of some showers here for central areas. You can see throughout the day they just kind of pop up. Not a whole lot of rain uh, to worry about as we get further on in the day that does start to move eastward. So yeah, I just wanted to show you what, like a closer picture of what it's going to be like. So here we are Saturday morning. You can see those little showers happening uh, there throughout the day for the Avalon Peninsula. We may see a little taste of that, but overall it's looking to be a rather cloudy uh, day on Saturday. So yeah, a mix of sun and cloud mostly for the east. The chance of showers for central temperatures getting up to 14 degrees for central. Staying cool on Saturday though for St. John's 9 degrees as the high. Lab City looking pretty good there. 15 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud on Saturday. And as we head into Sunday, we're looking at some cloudy skies, but things do clear off. We have a system that's moving in towards Labrador uh, West there on Sunday. So yes, this is Father's Day. Lots of people will be out celebrating and you can see it's looking pretty nice. A chance of shower action in the east, 11 degrees as the high there. A bit cooler uh, on Sunday for Grand Falls, Windsor, 14 degrees, 16 for 
Corner Brook and uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay is actually looking like the nicest spot on Sunday there for 19 degrees with a mix of sun and clouds. So the next system that we're keeping our eye on is moving in uh, Monday afternoon, Monday night. So that's going to bring some more rain to the province. Pretty much everyone is going to see rain with that. So here's a quick snapshot of your seven day. You can see uh, Sunday looking not too bad. Chance of showers I mentioned there as we get into Monday warming up a little bit, but then we do have this other system that's moving in again and uh, Hopefully this will pan out as we uh, get farther along into uh, the week next week. And for Labrador, yeah, lots of shower action coming as you begin the work week. Temperatures uh, bumping up just a little bit, though. So at least we have that. Jeremy. Thanks, Carolyn. Monkey bars, swings and slides. The new playground of St. John's might look like any other. But it isn't. The long-awaited playground at Easter Seals is fully inclusive, so that means kids of all abilities can enjoy it. Let's play. And they were certainly out enjoying it today, and even some adults getting in on it as well. Within minutes of its official unveiling, big smiles and high fives all across the Jeremy Cross Memorial Playground. It's named for a former staff member and client who died, leaving behind his vision for an accessible space. So thanks to years of fundraising and a detailed design process, the playground on Mount Sio Road is an immediate hit. Inclusion, everybody can play together, everybody can come out here and just chat or anything. There's a pirate ship that moves and so everyone can get on it and it bounces back and forth and the inclusive swings over here and there's also the, the ramps to the slides which makes a big difference. Well Canada's population is growing thanks largely to international migration but Newfoundland and Labrador's population is not following that trend. The country's population topped the 37 million mark and the rate of increase is picking up. As of April, the country's population grew by 1 million people in just 26 months. This province is the exception. Newfoundland and Labrador is the only province to show a population decrease during the first three months of the year. We're now just under 526,000. But the numbers aren't all bad. After years of packing on household debt, Canadians are reversing the trend and taking a baby step towards financial fitness. The latest numbers peg the average debt load at 168%. So that means a typical family owes $1.68 for every dollar earned. Now that is a two-year low. Mortgage borrowing fell to the lowest level in about three years, so the drop comes as tighter lending rules and higher mortgage rates cool the housing market. That means a dip in Ontario home prices, something the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation does not expect to last. Moving south of the border, the state of New York is suing Donald Trump, his children and his charitable foundation. New York's Attorney General says the foundation was used as a personal piggy bank to settle legal bills to pay Trump's businesses and to fund his presidential campaign. And that's all in violation of state law. The lawsuit filed this morning names Trump and his children, Donald Jr., Eric and Ivanka. It seeks $2.8 million in restitution and calls for the foundation to be dissolved. U.S. President Trump wasted no time tweeting about the suit, writing, The sleazy New York Democrats are doing everything they can to sue me on a foundation that took in $18.8 million and gave out to charity more money than it took in, $19.2 million. I won't settle this case. Isn't this gorgeous? Oh, wow. <laughs> I know who took that. And I, I have a feeling I think my brother-in-law might have been on that hike with him. Oh, nice. Oh. It must have been a beautiful hike. And and if that given, I still don't know where it is. I have an idea. <laughs> it's but got I don't to know. be Labrador, isn't it? No. no. Oh no, it's not the Northern Lights. It's just it's on the island. Somewhere dark. <laughs> That's right. I'll and let it, you know where this was taken after the break. <laughs>
Welcome back to Here and Now. If you've ever struggled with the cables and complications of hooking up a new TV, try doing it in outer space. Today, these two astronauts from the International Space Station spent hours outside. They were struggling to install two new high-definition televisions. So it's hard enough as it is, like with having full capability and use of your hands and not wearing a spacesuit. I can only <laughs> imagine what it's like. <laughs> but now those two TVs, if you're wondering why they're installing those TVs, they're going to provide clear views in the coming months of new crew capsules as they dock. And they're aiming for test flights of new commercial astronaut shuttles by year's end. So it's not like they're setting it up to watch the World Cup. <laughs> so they do have a serious purpose, even though it looks like a serious job. Just to, that, that would be awfully frustrating. Oh but, my uh, gosh. As you said in the intro, imagine trying it in space. It's hard enough at home. Yeah, that's why, you hire, that's why I would hire somebody. I'm not much of a DIY kind of guy. <laughs> Well, I wonder Sorry. if they would have a view of the stars as nice as the view of the stars from this viewer uh, photo of the day. Just, this is just beautiful. It really it is. is. A beautiful it picture. almost doesn't look real. It's, it's fantastic. Yep. I don't know if it's as good as the puffins getting married picture oh, that we I had like yesterday. That, one. that was a good one. But I don't want to knock Mr. Edwards. That's a great picture. And so where was it taken? This was taken in beautiful Swift Current. That's fantastic. So Jason Edwards uh, sent this in uh, to us. So thank you very much for that. I think yeah. Jason has sent in other pictures as well. He's a real uh, photog. Photog. Uh, yes, <laughs> a real photographer. He's a, he's a shutter bug, yeah, you might he, say. He needs some nice equipment for, uh, for a shot like that, I'm sure. Yeah, I know that uh, he and my brother-in-law do a lot of hiking and they take a lot of pictures and they got a lot of gear, so. Well, keep them coming, send them our way. <laughs> Well, we are uh, just about out of time for this portion of Here and Now. That's because uh, in the next half hour, we're going to be bringing you Home Court, the Carl English story. And Jeremy knows a whole lot about this. You are the guy behind the documentary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm uh, pretty excited about this. As I said last night, it's a story that I've been, wa I've been wanting to tell for a long, long time. And it's something that we worked on upstairs here in the editing suites and writing it for a long, long time. And we were even working on it up until about an hour ago. So <laughs> we wanted to make it good. You were making the point to me in the newsroom the other day that a lot of young people have taken yes. to Carl here with the edge, but they might not know the backstory. They so might not know the chance. incredible backstory that he has, and I figure that it's something that we needed to tell. So Absolutely. it's 23 minutes on number 2330 if you include commercials. So, oh, uh, <laughs> nice. Coincidence? I don't know. Really looking forward to it, Jeremy. I know it's going to be excellent. Uh, I hope everyone out there enjoys it as well. See you all tomorrow. Good night, everyone. Good night. It's possibly the most unlikely place for the road to basketball greatness to begin. Here on Newfoundland and Labrador Highway Route 100 through the Cape Shore community of Patricksville. A spot better known for fishing than sports. A place where the word net would be something you threw into the ocean, not something you threw a basketball into. But one man changed all that, putting the tiny town on the basketball map in this province, this country, and ultimately, the world. For the kid from Patrick's Cove, it was always an uphill battle. One of the biggest obstacles in the beginning was finding a net and a patch of pavement to play on. First we had it on the shed, just a piece of plywood, and uh, we used to beat the spokes out of a bicycle wheel. So we'd shoot on that, and then it came with those cheap nets, the big old round thinny ones, but then you hit the ball off that and that would bend. So just started getting creative with it, and then we finally built, I had one in the yard for a while, but that was on gravel. Um, funny story with that one, I was telling the guys, they didn't believe me, but to make the asphalt on that spot, I we used to go around and pick up bits of the road that would fall off in the wintertime. 
and then we got the drum and we lit the fire underneath the drum and we tried to melt the asphalt down. <laughs> so needless to say, it was just probably the same as the gravel. But uh, after that then, uh, I got my aunt and uncle to convince me, I convinced them to let me put it down on the road and that's where I was playing all the time. <laughs> If you don't know the story, you might not believe it, but this hoop, homemade with fishing net as backstop sitting by the side of the road, would launch English further than any other basketball player this province has ever produced. Me and my uncle got these trees, we got them cut into the sawmill and we built a stand. And I usually just have one single one coming up here, but it was always blowing and stuff in the wind and it was never very stable, so we designed this one. I was there all the time. I mean, the minute I got off the bus, boom, drop off my school bag, and I was down there till dark. Um, I was always there every day in the summertime. So that was kind of kind of the thing. I think the local the local people they always knew I was there, so they'd be slow. Some people stop and take some pictures, but it was more so the tourists that would come to the bird sanctuary. So a lot of people come out there to visit that, and they'd just be in awe. Like they, you'd see the strange license plates and the European license plates, and they'd you know the, with the accent they'd stop, and they were pretty much amazed that that was going on. But it wasn't always happy memories in his hometown. It's a memorial tattoo. Um, the first two are my mom and dad, the dates when they died, and the last one in the middle is uh, on the bottom is my uncle when he died. In the mid-1980s, when he was just five years old, English's young life was forever changed by tragedy. Uh, my parents died in a fire, and my four brothers and I survived, and I came to live with my aunt and them, and they went. One of my, my second oldest brother went to Manuals, and my three other brothers just lived about 10 minutes away. His parents passed away not long after the incident. I don't remember much about the fire, just like vague little memories. I don't know if they're true memories or what you hear people talk about. Um, I, I remember a few things. Uh, I remember talking to mom after it, um, but then as the days go on and things go on, you don't, I don't remember much. It pushes me a lot more because everything I do, really I do for my parents, right? You know, helps me, push me, keep me going. It's like, you know, if you want to stop, you just think, you know, they're looking out for you and watching you, so you just keep going. I found the hardest thing for me is when I became a teenager and I got older and, you know, you're wondering, you know, are they watching you? You're wondering, are they proud of you? You're wondering, are they happy with who you become as a man? I guess as a kid, you really don't know what's going on, you know, but then as you get older, it really sinks in and you, you deal with things and it can become extremely difficult, you know, you find your long nights, lonely nights, you find if things are not going well, you wonder what's going on, you, you ask a lot of questions, why me, why this? What are you supposed to do? Do you quit, do you give up, do you give in, or do you keep fighting, and I chose to keep fighting.
Let's go, let's go, let's go, Kyle. Even though he was just a teen dealing with a childhood tragedy, English kept driving on the courts. He earned a spot on the 1997 Canada Games team when he was just 16 years old. It's Canada Games, you're going to play against the best provinces, best players from each province, and they'll be more experienced than what I am because I'm younger, so I'm just looking forward to play against them. English's drive to make a future from basketball was fueled on by those who said he couldn't make it and ultimately forced him from his home. Looking for more exposure and to catch the attention of university scouts south of the border, he, like many Newfoundlanders before him, headed west. So I moved all the way up to Toronto to try to get recruited and the teachers went on strike. Um, so I decided to make a homemade video of myself and I was in the gym doing crossovers and moves and dunking and then at the end of it I put a championship game of us first Harbor Grace in grade 11 and I went into, they had a theater room so I went in and I converted over like a couple of hundred tapes and I sent them out to, I got the guidance counselor at the time, he got me all the college addresses so then I stamped all the things and we sent, I sent them to all the schools. How many would you think he sent? Uh, I'd say 150 or more for sure. Yeah, I was in there for hours just copying these tapes and a lot of the schools I sent it to were, were extremely interested and they were like, I want to see you play. And I was like, well, I'm not playing, you know? So uh, we had, after the teachers came off strike, we had one tournament there. I think I averaged like 40, so that drew some attention. English then took his skills to a series of showcase camps in the United States. His playing there solidified him as someone to watch including a standout performance in New Jersey. So after that weekend, I had about 50 scholarship offers. And then I went to Hawaii to basically do a visit. I was like, I'll never get a chance to go to Hawaii. So all these schools were calling me like, don't sign when you go there, it's going to be beautiful, blah, blah, blah. And the rest is history. I, I signed when I got there. <laughs> My freshman year, I didn't get to play much. Uh, struggled. Uh, Coach Riley Wallace didn't like to play a lot of freshmen. He was more old school and you had to put in your time. But uh, whatever way it worked out, a couple of guys got hurt or weren't doing what they were supposed to do and he finally gave me a chance. And to be honest, right up to that point, I was ready to transfer. So there was about 10 games left and my numbers got really good. And we went into the tournament. We actually made the tournament. So we went in as an eight seed and we end up winning it. And I was MVP of that tournament as a freshman and in the championship game, I think 28 or 32 points. And it actually won in overtime. So my whole life turned upside down then. I went from being a nobody to a lot of people were watching me, a lot of draft boards were watching me. I mean, I was the main guy at our school and everything changed for me right then. And everything changed for English off the court as well. After his first year in Hawaii, English came back to Patrick's Cove and went out fishing with his uncle Junior. He wasn't feeling well that, that day at all. Um, he don't usually ever complain. He just wasn't himself, you know, and he asked to come in and he never asked to go in, you know. He got up on the wharf and he never gets out of the boat. We unload the fish and go on. He got up on the wharf and then he just said my name and collapsed. And it was, it was crazy. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a tough one. Without his biggest fan and supporter in his corner, English returned to Hawaii more determined than ever. In 2001 and 2002, he led the Rainbow Warriors to the biggest stage in college basketball, the NCAA Final Four tournament. Hawaii is a beautiful school, but to, to get a path to the NBA is extremely hard because you're on an island. A lot of scouts are not really seeing you unless it's tournament time. And obviously, you play your best basketball when you're in your home court environment, so they'd only see me on the road. But um, for us to go to the tournament, you go in there, and I think we played, I forget where we played, but it was like a 60,000 foot arena, right? And we went out there, and there's cameras everywhere, and that was kind of the thing. We were kind of starstruck as a team. 
Hawaii lost in the first round in both tournaments, but English's stock as an NBA hopeful was on the rise. I kind of try to stay in the spotlight sense of not letting that stuff get to me. You know, and at the same point, as always, everybody wants to do the stories, everybody wants to score 20, and everybody wants to be the main guy, but how you, how you handle that is what I feel develop as your character. You know, either teams, either team is going to gravitate toward that, or they're going to be like, who, who does this guy think he is? So I try to handle that stuff with the right way and the right balance. So I, I kind of never let it get to me because I felt my journey, I wasn't ready, I wasn't done. So I was like, you know, this ain't it, this is just the start. English finished up his third year at Hawaii eager to move on. I uh, declare for the draft. I graduated early, so I felt it was time to it was time to make that next step. I was an early entry because I could have went back for my senior year and done some master courses or whatever or work on my my uh, master's degree. But I, I entered the draft because my stock was high at the time. And the interest was there. 13 NBA teams invited English to come for a tryout. And if I wanted to go back to school, I would have had to reimburse all those teams for anything they paid for me. So these are NCA rules. So I would have had to reimburse them for airfare, hotel fees, and any meals they gave me. So that was a substantial bill because they're flying you first class, they're putting you in the best hotel. So it was definitely probably, I'd say 50 to 75,000. So if I wanted to go back to school, I would have had to come up with that money to pay them back in order to be eligible for my senior year. So I decided to hire an agent and take my chances. English gambled and hired a real estate agent with no experience representing professional athletes. It was probably a big mistake I made with agent selection. This was more of a situation where I was his first client and I never should have subjected myself to that. But I had nobody to look to. I had nobody been there before me, really, and I trusted some of the wrong people. At a bar in Toronto, English sat, surrounded by family, friends, and the media to watch the 2003 NBA draft. All eyes on him, waiting to hear his name called. Things don't always go as planned, and I didn't expect this to happen. I didn't get drafted. <laughs> it was a tough night. I was a big deal, obviously. Uh, one of the next best coming from, let's say, a Steve Nash, and there was a lot of hype surrounding me because I played some national team stuff, and all my family flew up. Um, my girlfriend at the time, was my wife now, was there, all my brothers, and we're in like a couch-like setting, and every pick, all these camera lights come on, and I'm just there like, okay, anybody, just take me. So as it went on, I, I like I said, once it got to teams that I felt that where I should have went, once you got around the 20th, I was like, okay, any time now. And then guys start slipping, and then all these Europeans that nobody knew about were start getting taken, and and it just, it was like a snowball effect, and it just went through. And teams were calling me, saying, you know, what's going on, what are your plans, and I didn't understand. I was like, just draft me. They're like, no, no, we have no picks left. We want you to come for summer league. I'm like, well, why are you calling me? They're like, well, I tried to call your agent, but he's, his phone is off, so yeah, yeah, it was a rough night. Let's just leave it at that. Two weeks after the heartbreak of not getting drafted, the Indiana Pacers signed him to a two-year contract. I'm not just gonna be happy to go in there and drive the fancy car and wear the clothes and stuff. I'm going to get in there and I'm going to work the way I've been working to get where I am right now. And I'm not going to stop when I stop improving. That's when I'll stop playing. That was going great. And then they made a change and they fired their GM and they brought in a new coach. And I was with Isaiah Thomas at the time who was who really liked me. And I felt that would have been a niche. And again, my whole world turned upside down. So they had me in a house and they had my wife in school and I had a car and then the last hour after the hour I got cut, so it was, uh, it was, it was devastating, to say the least. Heartbroken, English didn't quit. He moved on to the NBA's development league. He played there for two years until he got a call from the Orlando Magic. They got my ticket. I went to the airport, um, and then as I was on the way, the uh, a big man went down, and they're like, "No, we can't, we can't sign you." Um, we need a big man, we're still watching, we're still following you. So it was one of those things where you're like, you're so close, but yet you're so far away.
When Carl English was unable to secure a spot on an NBA roster, he then headed east to play in Europe in 2005. When you're in Europe, you're like a rock star, you know, so it's a whole different, it's a whole different ball game because when you're in that city, let's say it's three, four million, you know, you're, you're the main attraction. He started in Italy and quickly moved on to Croatia. And I tore that up. I was MVP of that league and leading scorer in two different leagues, and we end up winning it all. So it was, uh, it was a great stepping stone there. And after that, I had had some NBA stuff after that as well, and like a lot of interest. Interest that saw him once again come close to achieving his dream of playing in the NBA, this time with the lone Canadian team, the Toronto Raptors. Jay was the coach, Jay Toronto, who coached me at national team, and um, it was a great opportunity, it seemed. So I went in there, did all the mini camp, and just before we went to Vegas, they signed, uh, they made a huge trade and brought in four guards. So from going into that situation, had two, two spots to overnight, you know, he looked at me and said, Carl, we just signed four guys. He's like, I know what you got on the table. He's like, even if we kept you, you're going to lose money. He's like, you got to take what you got on the table. English defended ahora por Rudy Fernandez. Intentará devolverse la lanzamiento de Cali English. Canasta para el... English put his NBA dreams aside to focus on European paychecks, taking his talents next to Spain. Amazing basketball. I uh, went there again. I played Gran Canaria my first two years. I had my son in Gran Canaria, and I had the next year I went to uh, Victoria. We won a championship there. That was an amazing team. There were seven guys on that team that were in the NBA or played in the NBA. So that was amazing, amazing team. Uh, we went to the top eight in EuroLeague as well. And then the next seven, eight years, I was all over Spain. English spent the off seasons playing for Team Canada, 12 years in total including a memorable game against the United States where he went up against one of the greatest players of all time, Kobe Bryant. Andy Routens as well, still a collegiate player. Michael Red was 9 of 9 for the entire Tournament of the Americas from the free throw line, and he misses one here. English off. English's tour then saw him move on to Greece and Puerto Rico before returning to Spain. And finally, Germany. But like the boomerang that exists in almost every Newfoundlander and Labradorian, English came home, this time for the NBL Canada and the first pro team in St. John's.
Carl English's career brought him back to where it all began. To set up the sport he loves in his home province. The first pro basketball league to play in St. John's. There was a lot more involved in this than money for me. I've always came here. I've always been a proud Newfoundlander. I mean, I played for Team Canada for 12 years. A lot of people know me, but then a lot of people have forgotten about me as well. With English on board, the fans bought into the St. John's Edge. Mile One Center was among the league leaders in attendance, including thousands who were on hand to watch him break the single game scoring record, a whopping 58 points. I've never been in an arena, you know, when Carl is there playing. You know, everyone wants to see what he's doing. Everyone wants, he scores 58 points. They want to see him do that again. You know, every movement is tracked and watched. And, and what it does from the fans, it, it, it helps to grow the game. You know, now younger fans and younger kids that now have someone to real life that you can, you know, you can touch and feel and aspire to. So, I mean, his impact goes well beyond what's happening on the court. English was the MVP of the league, and he led the edge to one of the best records in the NBL Canada, making an impact in almost every game he played in at 37 years old, the age when most pro ball players are calling it a career. But he doesn't forget where he came from, taking the edge out into the community to give back and to help grow the sport in Newfoundland and Labrador. From the lone highway in Patrick's Cove to the hard courts all over the world, English proved that nothing could hold him back. I dribbled on grass, I dribbled on rocks, I dribbled on anything. So to me it's about how far you're willing to push yourself. And right now it's a whole different animal because I'm 37 years old. You know what I mean? When I, I never used ice till I was 30 years old. I was playing on torn ligaments, you know what I mean, on my ankles and I'm like, oh, I don't want to people to think I'm soft. My ankles would probably be good if I didn't do that right now. So it's a whole cultural thing and it's a whole thing. I'm very old school in how I train. I'm very old school how I prepare and work. I just think there's nothing else than hard work. Hard work beats all. I just went by no one. At center court at mile one, reflecting on what has happened, the question of the NBA comes up again. My biggest regret, and I'll tell you now, is that I didn't leave the money and try it. When I got good, I didn't come back and try. When I got good, I stayed there and I got better and better and I tried to dominate that market over there. And yes, I got to the level and I was the top over there, but then I should have stopped and chased it and seen where I ended up. And then if I failed, I can go back over. And that was what I regret. It's not the regret that I didn't make it, it's the regret that when I was good enough, I didn't try. Many of these fans don't know the backstory as to how the kid from Patrick's Cove ended up here, what he's gone through, what he's achieved and overcome, but neither he nor them care. For English, it's always been about his family, his home, and his love of basketball.